Hi everybody, welcome back to Capricorn Radio TV. This is your host James and we have an audio show only today. We're going to be talking uh, live from London uh, to Lynn Picknett. Uh, a little bit about Lynn before I bring her on. Lynn Picknett is a writer and a broadcaster. She's deputy editor of the seminal British publication The Unexplained in the 1980s and has appeared regularly on radio and television. Lynn has worked with Clive Prince since 1989. And uh, their first collaboration was on research into the Shroud of Turin that led to their first joint book, Turin Shroud, In Whose Image. They were first researchers to successfully create a replica of the image of the Shroud, including all of the so-called miraculous characteristics, and their work has been the subject of a major BBC documentary in 95, and a documentary for the National Geographic in 2001. Uh, there's a wealth of books from uh, Lynn, Mary Magdalene, Christianity's Hidden Goddess, which I think we're going to focus on today, uh, with my co-host Heather. Heather Osborne and uh, uh, if you want to follow along with today's author and researcher you can go to picknetprints.com that's picknetprints.com P-I-C-K-N-E-T-T uh, and you can read all about the collaboration of these two researchers and Lynn is live on the call with us as we speak and I'm going to hand you over to my co-host Heather first of all great to hear you again Heather. Great to be here James I'm excited. Wow, I've had the pleasure of meeting Lynn uh, at the Origins Conference recently, so uh, it was lovely to see Lynn. Great presentation. She's a very enigmatic speaker and definitely commands attention. Uh, so without further ado, let's get the show on the road, Heather. Great, thank you. Well, I'm excited, Lynn, because you really are one of the instrumental writers who influenced my own work. Um, wow. When I first, yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. When I first read the your Mary Magdalene book, I think I believe it was 2003, mm -hmm. and um, it really influenced my writing. And it was a seminal work, I think. And um, I wanted to just kind of jump right in with the reality of the truth of who is Mary Magdalene really, and what does the name Magdala mean? Because that's instrumental isn't it, in understanding her identity, and it's misunderstood. Well, it is. Um, it, I think Mary Magdalene means different things to different people within the sort of general Western semi-Christian civilization, you know. I mean, she means um, something different to, say, a New Age person, to a standard Christian person, or to a Catholic or a Protestant. Um, she only appears about eight, I think I'm right in saying about eight times by name in the New Testament. It doesn't appear at all in the Acts of the Apostles. Um, and But the thing about her is that she's very special, not just because she hardly appears in the New Testament, and yet she's got this incredible reputation. Um, it's because, first, well, as you say, the first start, the main thing is what does um, Magdala mean? Um, and, you know, does it mean that she's from a place called Magdala, which is what you know, people thought for a very long time? Mag Mary Magdalene, is she from Magdala? Um, and it doesn't seem very likely because um, the place that became known as Magdala later was actually known as Tarikia at her time. Um, so it didn't really exist as such. Um, but also, um, people used to talk about, used to talk about Mary Magdalene. But actually, the translation should be Mary called Magdalene, as if Magdalene was either a nickname or a title, or both. Um, so, um, what does Magdalene mean if it's not the name of the place that she comes from? And it would seem to mean Great Lady. So, it could either mean that it's a joke nickname because she was very tall or very fat. <laughs> we don't have to think of those, <laughs> those terms. Um, or because she was a great lady. Um, or because she puts on her airs and graces, perhaps. You know, one has to consider these things. So, um, but whatever she was, she existed. And I think that's a, another big question these days. And the reason I say that with some degree of confidence is that... Um, when she appears in both the New Testament and the Forbidden Books, the Gnostic Gospels, um, there's, there's conflict around her. There's negative stuff around her. And if you were creating, if you were just inventing somebody to stick in a gospel that you were writing for future people, you would make somebody all sweetness and light and a nice person and there was never any question about them. But in reality, Mary Magdalene caused trouble. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't actually choose to fabricate somebody like her. 
Yes, and that brings up, you know, the whole um, Madonna whore split that we see within society today. And she's so often identified with the whore. And how is that a misnomer? Well, it, yeah, you're right there. Absolutely, Heather, because, um, you, you know, she's associated with the, the nameless woman who, who committed sins and was possessed by demons and, and Jesus threw the, the demons out. Um, and a, a pope in, the, I think it was the 7th century A.D., said basically his thinking was, look, Mary Magdalene was a woman, uh, she had demons cast out of her, she was a sinner, um, what kind of sin could it possibly be? Well, as, as she was a woman, it must have been sexual, she must have been a whore. So that was his thinking. Um, and it was very interesting, that, and I think it was 1968, something like that, the Catholic Church actually officially um, revoked that that belief. They they issued this statement saying there's no evidence that she was actually ever a prostitute. But they said it very, very quietly and didn't draw attention to it at all. So in fact, um, most Catholics still think that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. But there's one thing, Heather, that is kind of amusing in a sick kind of way. That in the New Testament it says that Mary Magdalene and, and lots of other women obviously quite rich women, um, ministered unto Jesus and the, the male disciples of their substance, which actually means they provided money for the funds for the mission, for Jesus' mission. So right. if, Mary, if Mary Magdalene had actually ever been a prostitute, then Jesus and the other men would have been living off immoral earnings. <laughs> <laughs> It puts a new twist on it, doesn't it? <laughs> One of the really gripping things you begin the book with is talking about the Magdalene laundries. Oh. And this is a, a definitive side effect of this depiction of the Magdalene as the whore. Could you talk yeah. about that a little bit? Because it really pertains to today, doesn't it? It does, and thank you for bringing that up. Yes, I got very, very incensed, to put it mildly, um, by discovering, I mean, I didn't know anything about it. When I, when I started researching Mary Magdalene, I was just sort of generally just looking for things about her, things that had been done in her name. And to my absolute horror, I discovered, this was about the late um, 1990s, something like that, a scandal that was just then coming to light in Ireland, um, which... Basically, there were these um, institutions going back at least a century, um, usually in remote parts of Ireland, um, called Magdalene Laundries. And basically, um, they were attached to convents or to orphanages run by nuns, so they're always attached to nunneries of some kind and run by nuns. Basically, young women, often pregnant outside marriage, or sometimes that had just done something to upset the local priest in some way, and, and young, when I say young women, could be girls or young women, were basically taken in the middle of the night from their beds, just like, you know, secret police do in many countries still, um, and taken to these laundries where they were treated as slaves, literally as slaves, for the rest of their lives. Um, very few actually ever got out. They were tortured, they were starved, they were beaten, they were raped, they were sexually abused by both the nuns and the father confessors who went there. Um, and if they, a, a few of them tried to get away and they were basically beaten to a pulp if they were found, um, a few, even fewer of them tried to report to the priests, to the authorities, but the authorities were in on this in Ireland, and also elsewhere, it has to be said, like Scotland to some extent. Um, it was basically on a vast scale. It was the Magdalene laundries, you know, they worked the laundries for the local people, so it was a business but they were treated like absolute slaves. Uh, I mean, they even had to change their name when they went in, so that the last, just like, you know, slaves in, in, uh, in 19th century and before America, changed their names. Every last shred of humanity was gone. Um, they were treated like absolute dirt because they were Maggies, Magdalens. They, like Mary Magdalene, should learn penitence. And it was in her name, these terrible things were done to these women, these young women and girls. Um, and, and basically, the bottom line is Mary Magdalene has been associated throughout the centuries with a kind of brand name for female shame. When in fact, reading about her in, in the Gnostic Gospels, the ones that didn't make it into the New Testament, such as the Gospel of Thomas or the Gospel of Philip, it's quite clear she's the least ashamed woman in history. You know, they got that wrong. Right. But, but you know, the, um, the, the, the whole Magdalene Laundry thing, I mean, 
thousands upon thousands of women just basically disappeared. I mean, I used to give a talk about this, and afterwards, I would actually occasionally meet people who'd come up and say, my auntie disappeared into that system in Ireland. You never heard of her again. You know, so-and-so did. You know, um, she was a broken woman. She's, you know, mentally very disturbed now, et cetera, et cetera. The most terrible thing. And it was only because some nuns um, near, uh, I'm going back to the late 90s, some nuns that, uh, in a, a nunnery near Dublin um, uh, wanted to buy some land it's, uh, sorry, wanted to sell some land. And the, the guys who were buying the land started digging and found mass graves. Um, graves of children and, and young women, as it turned out, or indeed older women. Um, and there were no names. They'd just been chopped in, in these graves. And then the whole thing started to come out. And it's still rumbling on to this day. Um, it's just absolutely shocking. And it really got to me, you know, because I was, I was born you know, outside marriage, and um, I mean, I didn't suffer in any way, but I could have done, you know. It really hits home, doesn't it? As yeah. women, it could happen to any of us, yeah, you exactly. know, yeah. and it, that's really frightening, really and frightening. And it was done, done in Mary and, you know, and throughout, um, certainly in, in, in the UK, um, in the past, centuries for centuries and centuries, any woman who was deemed by by the authorities or you know good society, respectable society, was deemed to be um, an outcast in some way, usually sexually, um, they, they were known as Magdalens. You know, um, uh, it was it, it, it was automatically you know associated with the idea of her as this sort of eternal penitent, somebody who has to suffer for being a full female. It's just, uh, it's just really scary. You know, even for me growing up as a, the daughter of a single mother, like mm. she was divorced, but still I saw what my mother had to go through that I don't have to go through now. Yeah. But it's just really frightening how slowly things changed and mm. how women were treated. Oh, yes. Well, appallingly. Absolutely appallingly. Um, you know, I mean, the, the, some of the, uh, the the stories about the, the girls who ended up in the Magdalene Laundries in Ireland, you know, they didn't have children um, outside of marriage, and you know, some of some of them just did virtually nothing at all. One girl, for example, was caught walking down a road talking to a Catholic, to a Protestant boy, and that was enough. The local priest oh, said, "That's just you know absolutely outrageous. You know, she'll never see the light of day again," and she didn't. There is actually a movie, well, there's actually a couple of television um, series as well, but there's a movie that won awards simply called The Magdalene Sisters, and it's very hard-hitting, right. very hard-hitting. I've seen it a while ago, yeah. but yeah, it was yeah. really powerful. And really at the powerful. end, do you remember at the end where all those names just came up silently, name after name uh, after name, yeah. of, the, of the women that they, they found? I mean, thousands upon thousands of them, just astonishing just disappeared into the system. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I teach a women and gender roles class, and these are the kinds of things we talk about all the mm -hmm. time, looking at the history of how things have evolved, yeah. but yet also how a lot of things haven't changed. And it comes back again to this Madonna horse split yeah. that was created by the church yeah. and is still in, is in existence today and the yeah. way women are viewed. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, it's, it is it is astonishing um, how I mean somebody was saying to me this has got nothing to do with Mary Magdalene but it's just the way even um, you know sort of in in shall we say um, uh, liberal society you know it, in in sort of media terms um, you know these these things kind of still permeate and um, you know it was talking about um, uh, these days you know on any kind of panel on 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 BBC television you know you have to have a woman you see. And this guy I was talking to, who is an older sort of um, um, ex-BBC producer, and he said, oh, just imagine trying to find some woman who knows what she's talking about all the time. And I said, but you've been doing it for decades with, with men. Does this mean that every single time, every man that you got on there was a really good panelist? And he said, no, right. I suppose not, you know. Right, exactly. You know, it's yeah. And we can proudly say that we're the two women on Forbidden History. <laughs> <laughs> we are indeed. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Holding it up for our gender. <laughs> well, quite sometimes I wonder, you know, when you go to conferences and I'm the only woman there, you know. Um, exactly. And I just think, you know, what is this? Um, but, uh, 
well, yes, you know, we've got things to say and we should be allowed to say them, really. But I think women often, we don't push ourselves, you know, that, I mean, we kind of have to, which is annoying, but. That's true. That's mm. true. I, I often say that to Gary, you know, my husband, yeah. I'm like, you know, there's Lynn and now they're saying there's me and there's like, there's not a lot of women out there and they keep yeah. telling me this. And I'm like, well, we're going to change that. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> of course. Yes. I mean, you know, we just need a bit of passion and a bit of humor and a bit of, you know, whatever else it takes. And, and off we go. Hopefully. Exactly. Hopefully. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we'll stick together. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of the Gnostic Gospels, what mm. do they reveal about what Mary Magdalene's true role was, not only with Jesus, but also amongst the apostles? Because there's some really interesting mm. information there, especially like about Peter and the way that he viewed oh, her yeah. also. Yeah. Oh, yes. yes, I mean, there are absolute revelations in the Gnostic Gospels um, about um who Mary Magdalene was, and you know, in, in as you say, her relevance to Jesus is astonishing. Um, but she was, as I say, she 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 was trouble. <laughs> um, I often think that um, it comes it comes across, you know, it loud and clear that she was a kind of Yoko Ono character. You know, you remember? Well, I'm not saying you remember, but people remember how you know when um, John Lennon fell in love with Yoko Ono, and she she started rightly or wrongly it was it was said that she broke broke the band up she broke the Beatles up um and but he of course absolutely adored her and he couldn't see what what she was doing wrong or what you know why they were taking this attitude and it, it looks like that to me that when Mary Magdalene kind of took over it has to be said in Jesus's mission um they um you know the men did not like it they didn't understand it um, she behaved didn't behave like a you know a, a good um a Jewish woman sort of hiding in corners and just getting them, you know, washing their feet and looking after them. She she wanted to be there in the limelight. She wouldn't shut up. Who does that, sh that remind me of? Anyway, she wouldn't shut up. <laughs> and, um, and she, you know, she she was very feisty. She, as I say, she was just not like the usual woman from, from the men we used to. And Peter, especially Saint Peter, was Simon Peter. He he hated her. I mean, he, there's no two ways about it. And we know this because Mary went to Jesus and said, Peter hates the whole race of women, and I'm afraid of him because he threatens me. I you know, oh. you know you really read that as, you know, he threatens to either beat me up or kill me, or both, you know. Um, exactly. Je Jesus was a complete sort of diplomat and smoothed it over, but you, the very much the impression you get is if it, the moment he's not there, all hell will break loose. Um, and then... Uh, Peter goes to Jesus and says, Lord, let Mary leave us, for women are not worthy of life. Um, and oh, my think, goodness. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's this rather wonderful bit, I think, um, because it's quite funny. I mean, you kind of have to see it, you know, like, I don't know, it's like, it reminds me a bit of school, um, because you have this in um, this uh, whole question and answer session with Jesus. Again, I'm talking about the Gnostic Gospels. Um, I think there's something like 42 questions Jesus either asks or answers, and it's, you know, it's thrown open to all the disciples, including, I have to say, some women. There's Martha, Mary's sister, and one or two others. Um, but of the 42 questions, Mary Magdalene either asks or answers 39. <laughs> oh, wow. and, and, the, and the men really, really don't like it, and they're completely baffled as to why she's allowed to do it. And she has this this um, thing that she does, this sort of, I have to say, I'm sorry, but a kind of false modesty, because she knows what she's doing. And she begins every statement or every question she makes, she says, Lord, don't be angry with me, but... And then she launches into this thing that she's going to say. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, you know, you have uh, Philip, St. Philip, who's, who's the, he's taking the notes, he's the note taker for the session, and he complains, and he says, you know, not in these words, obviously, but he says, Lord, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm busy, I can't, I can't take part in this, and I really want to, but the women are, are you know, are doing it all. And again, Jesus moves it all over, but um, and there is in there like a shot, you know. <laughs> 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 um, I mean, just an amazing woman. And also, there's, there's indications that she gets Jesus to change his doctrine. On one occasion, he's talking about, you know, when people commit these kind of sins or go to that particular bit of hell and, you know, and, um, and there he says, but I don't see why we should allow this to happen. Why can't we go in there and get him out and explain things to him? 
And I was thinking, oh, special services, Mary, you know. She said, <laughs> go in there, guns blazing. Um, and, um, and Jesus says, oh, yes, now, you know, thou good and compassionate Magdalene. And basically he says, what a good idea. And he completely changes what he's going to say about it. Wow. So and, she had a great deal of influence on him. Well, yes, I sometimes think of her standing behind him when he's giving the Sermon on the Mount with a little pointy stick saying, don't forget the bit about the meek. <laughs> <laughs> we agreed, we agreed. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I've got into trouble about Mary Magdalene myself because, as you probably gather, I see her very much as a real human being because if she existed, she had her flaws. You know, she. Um, but, you know, some people, especially in the New Age, they get very upset. They just want to see her as a goddess, you know, um, with absolute right. sort of no flaws and, you know, um, with absolutely no humour. With no, And I just think that is perhaps... And misguided, shall we say, because yes. as I say, if she really existed, she was human. And and you can get a flavour of the woman, even after all this time from the Gnostic Gospels. Um, she did not understand, you know, she she didn't, how can I put it, she didn't um, um, demean herself to kind of explain things to people. She And she was there with Jesus. They were, the impression you get is they were very much a duo and they ran the mission. She and him, which makes the fact that people, you know, have basically maligned and marginalized her for centuries all the more astonishing, really. Right. Was there the sense also that she was his successor, that she would take yeah. on his ministry in his stead? Yeah. And well, he, I mean, you, you kind of have to put two and two together, but it's very easy. I mean, he, again, in Gnostic Gospels, but he talks about her sitting with him throughout eternity. Um, he doesn't talk about Peter, who, you know, Catholic Church claims is, was his true successor. He never talks about Peter. He talks about her and he talks about the young St. John sitting on either side of him throughout eternity. And then he says that she, meaning Mary Magdalene, she knows the all. He calls her the all. She knows all. In other words, she is, you know, if you put two and two together, she obviously is his successor. Um, but, um, I mean, basically, when Jesus was out of the way, um, I mean, you know, one has virtually nothing to go on. It's just uh, speculation. But, um, you know, I wouldn't have liked to have been her, basically. I think Definitely. that's probably, probably where the, the, you know, the stories about her fle fleeing um, across the Mediterranean to the south of France, probably, I would see that that has the ring of truth because she would, you know, have the likes of Peter after her. Um, which is something people don't think about. Like some people, you know, ascribe to the theory that she, she fled to France, but a lot of people don't consider that the apostles themselves, or particularly Peter, might have been a danger to her. Well, exactly. I mean, that's very much the impression you get, you know, from reading, um, you know, the likes of the Gospel of, of Thomas. Um, you know, Peter is always you know, threatening her. And there's a, a fragment called the Gospel of Mary, which is a Gnostic Gospel, and it refers to Mary Magdalene. It's not by her. That You know, in those days, they didn't have any idea about authorship. You know, they called something Gospel of Tom, Thomas or the Gospel of Mary, not written by Thomas or Mary. But anyway, there you go. But there is there is this, you know, the, the little fragment, the Gospel of Mary, and it describes how after Jesus is crucified, uh, the, the male disciples are getting drunk and sitting around depressed. And she goes up to them and she says, now, look, I had this vision, or maybe it was a dream, but anyway, I can't remember, but she says, you know, and Jesus came to me and, you know, he said, that I must come and rouse you and you must go out there on a mission and preach the gospel. And Peter just says, why should we listen to you, a woman, you of all people? You know, the hate showing through, you know. Yeah. Um, and, um, and one of the others comes to her rescue, I think it was Levi, and he basically says, no, but this is the person, this is the woman, this is the one of us that Jesus loved the most. Um, and, and, and therefore, Peter, listen to what she has to say. But the bottom line is that if that's even remotely correct, that little scenario, it was Mary Magdalene who actually made Christianity what it is, because the men were going to give up, and she said, no, go out there and preach the gospel. She started Christianity, it wasn't Paul. Which is amaz an amazing secret that yes. they would want to cover up, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. Well, I mean, she even, she, I mean, the, 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 even the thing about her, you know, in, in the New Testament, although she's not named, but it's clear who she is in the context, um, in, this mysterious woman who basically insists on pouring you know, expensive um, perfume over Jesus' 
um, and the male disciples, yet again, they don't understand what's going on, and they, they complain to Jesus, you know, they, what is this woman doing? You know, they say, you could, you know, she, why waste all this perfume on, on you? You know, you could sell this and get a lot of money for the poor. And Jesus is, you know, kind of these men just don't get it because he knew what was happening. This was a ritual. The men didn't get it. It was just between him and Mary Magdalene. And we know we could work out what the ritual meant because Christ means anointed one. But in the whole of the New Testament, there is only one anointing and it's that one. It's done by a woman. So Mary Magdalene Christened Jesus. And he says in that in that very passage, he said, she has prepared my body for the burial. In other words, she has given me, handed me my fate. This is it. This is the moment when my fate really begins. She has Christened me. But, you know, the men just bang on about selling stuff and getting money for the poor because they think that's going to appeal to Jesus, obviously. And they get it completely wrong. <laughs> um, um, but, um, um, but uh, it, you know, and... It, she has, you know, people know John the Baptist baptised Jesus, but virtually nobody seems to have realised what Mary Magdalene did. Um, so and, Mary, uh, sorry, oh, go sorry, on. go ahead. No. Oh, Mary Magdalene and Mary of Bethany were one and the same, and this was actually a kingship ritual and anointing. Well, indeed, yes. I mean, it was it was singling him out, wasn't it, for this astonishing fate, whatever it was deemed to be. I mean, obviously, people have their own versions of this because it's not very clear. But nevertheless, he was very important to those who followed him. And she knew this, but she was making him that extra bit special. And it was, you know, what it, it sounds like um, uh, not a private ritual because the men were there not understanding it, you know. Um, so it was... Obviously, something very astonishing was going on, to which they were not party. He, neither of them, neither she nor Jesus, had confided about this ritual to the men. Maybe they were just expected to understand, but they were always incredibly dim. Um, <laughs> um, especially Peter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the truth is finally revealed about Peter. <laughs> well, I mean, again, oh yes, well, it's it, a Gnostic gospel where Jesus loses his temper with Peter. It basically, obviously not in these exact words, but he, he, he says, look, I try and take, teach you things. I try and tell you things over and over and you never get it. Um, you know, and, um, and, you know, and you'll, you, you all, you're handy with your fists, but you don't think things through. You know. Uh, on Mary, on the other hand, you know, it's exactly what he wants in all sorts of ways, presumably. That's the other thing, of course, that people just can't get a handle on. Um, and one of the main reasons I would suggest why the Gnostic Gospels have been forbidden and not known until very recently is because it's quite clear that whatever ritual or religious purpose Mary Magdalene has in the group or with Jesus, she is also his lover. Now, I personally don't think she was actually married to him, but I think she was his lover. And you get um, th these sort of extraordinary little interchanges where you have one of the male disciples saying to Jesus, and I'm sorry, but this is very funny, I think, saying, um, Lord, why do you love her more than you love us? Why are you always kissing her on the mouth? And you think, come on, boys, why do you think? You know, um, <laughs> and, and actually it is even funnier than that because it's not necessarily mouth in that quote, you know, why are you always kissing her on the mouth? Because that bit of the ancient scroll is missing. So it just says, why are you always kissing her on the... Um, so it could be anything. Yeah. But but I would suggest it could be in that culture, kissing her on the hand would be submissive on the part of a man. You know, it could be that. It doesn't have right. to be lips or mouth, you know. But it's interesting because the standard sort of conventional Christians hate the Gnostic Gospels and they try and say things like, oh, well, of course, it he, he, he was just, he was, why are you always kissing her on the cheek? And you say, yeah, but if he was always kissing her on the cheek, why why did that offend the men so much? You know. Exactly, exactly. So was this part of the ancient Egyptian mysteries? Were they enacting a parallelism with Isis and Osiris through these rituals? Um, it is possible, yes. It does look that way, or at least, um, uh, you know, the I Isis and Osiris were, uh, were gods, uh, ancient Egyptian gods, um, Isis the goddess, the mother goddess, the goddess of magic, um, very sexual um, creature, um, 
you know, no Virgin Mary was she, you know, um, a, a full woman could uh, could um, pray to her under any circumstances, a woman. <laughs> um, 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 but um, um, yeah, and um, and Osiris was uh, Isis is consort, um, and um, uh, Osiris was uh, basically torn to pieces by a baddie. Um, and the story goes that, that through her magic, um, uh, Isis put him back together again. And they had sex and produced this magical child, Horus. Um, it is, of course, a story. It's a myth. Um, and I think ancient Egyptians believed, understood that it was um, a sort of transcendent myth rather than a, a literal reality, or some of them might have done, of course. Um, but Mary Magdalene... Um, and Jesus did have Egyptian links. And, you know, a lot of people say, although oh, there's certainly no way one could be 100% sure of this, but, you know, a lot of people say that Jesus spent a lot of time in Egypt. Um, and certainly a lot of the things he did were, had Egyptian um, resonances. And indeed, the Jewish Talmud describes Jesus as um, an Egyptian sorcerer which is very interesting for all sorts of reasons. Wow. Uh, um, but, yeah, so, um, but one way or another, Mary and um, Jesus would have been very familiar with the Isis and Osiris story because they had mystery plays, basically. They, they enacted the, the um, priests and priestesses of Isis and Osiris would enact the story uh, to, you know, in front of the people, um, taking on the part of, of the god and goddess. And they would know um, the story. And it's very interesting that when, um, uh, you, you know, the story in the New Testament where um, Jesus um, has been crucified and his body um, is taken to the tomb and Mary goes to attend to his body um, and she can't find it. Um, and she, well, we know that basically she bumps into Jesus but doesn't recognize him. And she says, they have taken my Lord and I know not where they've lain him. Um, and it, it goes on from there. Um, it's quite a, a short little story, but actually that's what happened, and, and those wo exact words are used in the Isis and Osiris um, mystery play, where um, Isis is roaming about, you know, trying to find the various bits of the torn to shreds Osiris and reassemble them, and someone comes to her and says, you know, my lady, where are you? What are you doing? And she said, they've taken my Lord and I know not where they've lain him. Um, and um, sort of echoes of that, um, very strong. And also the other dying and rising gods of, of around the Mediterranean at the time, they, you know, in, even Jerusalem um, wasn't, um, you know, 100% Jewish. I mean, they had all sorts of other religions and all sorts of other cultures there. And they did mystery plays once a year as well in the streets of Jerusalem. So, um, I mean, even if there wasn't a direct Egyptian connection with, um, with Jesus and Mary Magdalene, even if they just stayed in, in Jerusalem, they would know something about this. And it does seem that there was a consciousness, a conscious enactment um, of the, the god and goddess um, story. And as you say, you know, the, the anointing Mary of, of Jesus has the element of... of um, of, of, of ritual, uh, of of ed, not just christening him, making him the Christ, but turning him into the sacred king, as you said. And so that right. the king, the king is also the god, you know, in Egypt. Because it very much seems to me, from the evidence you presented, that she was a priestess of Isis, and that that's the ritual that she was enacting, yes. not I mean, some kind of Jewish yes. ritual. Yes, I, I, to be honest, I think that. It, he was um, mixing together quite a lot of elements. Um, there's some Samaritan elements, um, which, by the way, we talk about in uh, a kind of sequel to the Temple of Revelation, which is called The Masks of Christ. Um, um, I mean, Jesus was a bit of an outlaw, a bit, a bit of an outcast. And, um, I mean, he, he had uh, very much, very strong Egyptian elements, as you say, absolutely. But also he had other elements and was probably trying to, you know, it's almost impossible actually to work out what he was trying to do. But there does seem to be, I would go so far as to say, strong hints 
but he was trying to return Jewishness back to its goddess worshipping foundations, which was very heavily influenced by Egypt, you know, going way back. So that seems to be um, certainly one thing that he was about. Um, but I mean, it all fell apart because he died the death of a common criminal, and then they all had to reinvent him. <laughs> which, right. Uh, you know. Um, but that, I mean, one of the greatest reinventions of history, really. So do you think that the union between them through the sacred marriage, that, um, you know, other um, researchers have talked about this, but do you think there's some element of truth to that, that they were trying to create some kind of magic or mystery there um, through their union um, that would inspire people or energize them or enlighten them further? I think... I think so. I think um, I think it, it's difficult, isn't it, to actually be a hundred percent certain about something like um, right. magic, magic as such. I mean, I'm inclined to think yes, because there is a magical element to the sacred marriage anyway. You know, that's what it is. It's a kind of <laughs> magical, transcendental union. It's sort of sex magic taken up several notches. You know. Um, and um, and so that is that is magic. It is magic. Um, so Definitely. yes, I think trying to, as you say, energize them. Um, I'm not sure what they were trying to do for other people. I think um, I think I know a lot of people would be horrified at me saying this, but I can only say what I believe. I'm not sure that necessarily they were as into other people or cared about other people as much as um, one would, you know, um, people would have us believe. Um, I think they were intensely wrapped up in each other, um, and um, she was intensely focused on um, making him this special person. Um, and it was presumably, presumably by then it was quite clear he wasn't going to be the um, the Messiah in the Jewish sense, you know, because that was a military role. You know, that was the the the, the um, Jewish Messiah was never expected to be a religious figure at all. He was he was somebody who would you know lead armies against um, the enemy, and in that case, Rome. And Jesus never did that. Um, so uh, there are hints actually at one point that he did try to do that, but it didn't work. Um, but um, but you know, he he was never going to be the the, the Jewish Messiah. Um, and so something else had to happen. And I think that you're quite right that something else was focused on the two of them and where they were going. You know, I, I wouldn't we like to be not only flies on the wall listening to their conversation, <laughs> um, but also being able to translate it, of course, would help. Um, <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> subtitles, subtitles would help. Um, but um, yes, I mean, you know, I, um, again, I, you know, a great many people would be horrified by this, but I, you know, I think of Jesus as, as just a man, and, and actually quite a flawed man, um, but of course a completely fascinating one. Um, and that's how I see her. Uh, I think she's in, she's incredibly important, as you do, I know, um, because of what's happened in her name, um, because she was known to be so important to him, and yet the very first, you know, church, the, the, if you like, the early, very early Vatican, they knew how important she was to Jesus. But they just said, oh, she's a prostitute, who cares? Because they didn't want you know, generations of women behaving like her. Right. Um, and it was, in, you know, they were insulting Jesus, the man they were supposed to worship. It was astonishing. And it's interesting, too, you point out that not everyone was a follower of Jesus. I mean, John the Baptist had quite a few followers, oh, and there yes. seems to be like a huge rift that happened between them. Oh, yes. I mean, that's a major thing, absolutely. And that was the thing that, you know, I was brought up a Christian and um, and to discover that, in fact, John the Baptist and Jesus were rivals and that all that rather sickening scene in the New Testament where John falls down at Jesus' feet and goes, oh, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy, you know. And everybody, look, it's the Lamb of God. I told you about him. Here he is. Um, but, um, <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, it, I mean, that simply cannot have happened because they actually, I mean, it's very likely, and in fact, it, it's quite interesting, the consensus of you know, modern biblical scholars who tend to be quite conservative in their views is that Jesus began his mission as John, one of John the Baptist's disciples. 
um, and then something went terribly wrong. Uh, and we know it went wrong. Um, and he, he could, Jesus could well have been lined up to be John's successor. But when John the Baptist was arrested and banged up in Herod's dungeon, um, and, and this is in the New Testament, although you probably never hear this out, read out in church, but the last known thing that John did or said was get a message out to Jesus from jail saying, are you really the one who is to come or do we have to look for another? In other words, wow. you know, this is the man who apparently fell down at his feet saying, well, let's all worship him. Um, but um, and then suddenly says, actually, I think I was wrong. <laughs> it doesn't really, it doesn't really work. Um, and, then, and, yeah, and then the next thing that happened to John is that he gets beheaded rather mysteriously. But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> but it's interesting because his head then becomes tied to the Grail and the Templars, which Ooh. is also, and the Grail has also been associated with Mary Magdalene. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Um, um, yes, because a lot of people, you know, the story of her going to um, the south of France, fleeing. Uh, you know, and various people said, oh, she had the Holy Grail with her, and, you know, <clears throat> and, and it, it, some people say, um, oh, yeah, well, it was the Holy Grail with a child, her, her Jesus, or she was pregnant with his child, and, you know. Um, but it could be, I suggest, John the Baptist's head, if indeed, you know, that, I mean, they didn't think in terms of the Holy Grail, because that was an invention, a medieval invention anyway. That's why it's never mentioned in the New Testament. There wasn't any such thing. But if we're right. talking about something very precious that she insisted on taking with her, it could have been John the Baptist's head, simply because it was believed that when Jesus started doing his miracles, which he only did after John died, by the way, the people said he does this because of John the Baptist. And King Herod said he does this because he has John. Now, that actually was a specific accusation. It means he owns a part of John's body. Because in those days, oh. to own the part of a murdered man meant you had domination over his spirit and you could make, make his head prophesy. Wow. And that was to have extraordinary power. And only recently it occurred to me, you know, because it's Herod who says, you know, he does this because of John the Baptist. And I think, wait a minute, John's, John's beheading happened on... Um, on Herod's own property. So if anybody should know the truth, he should. Right. But, right. Um, so um, anyway, and then there's you know the followers of John the Baptist, um, and and you know they have gone run parallel with the mainstream church, but underground for obvious reasons, um, for centuries, and they still exist. They're called the Mandians. Um, they're an Arab tribe, actually. Um, they believe that John was the true Christ, the true anointed one, um, and that Jesus wasn't a very nice person, um, to put it mildly. Um, and until um, things got too hot in the Middle East, uh, they used to go on annual pilgrim, pilgrimages to um, Damascus, where in, in a mosque, would you believe, and behind a special metal grill, there was something believed to be the head of John the Baptist. And the Mandians, the followers, modern day followers of him, they would go and then put their heads against the metal grill and apparently they would see visions and sometimes they would hear him speak to them. Oh, wow. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, so, you know, and then there's the, the grail stories, you know, as I say, sort of basically invented in, in the Middle Ages, but they were invented by the Templars or Templar-influenced writers who, um, you know, had... Associations with John the Baptist, uh, the Templars were accused of worshipping a bearded, severed head, etc. I mean, indeed, it looks like that they did. They weren't just accused of it. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, you, you, you have this, this connection. Um, and they, the, the Holy Grail, I mean, the, the very first Holy Grail stories, the Grail isn't anything. It's just this thing that you have to search for, perhaps truth, you know, or something. And then, as the stories go along, the next one, it was a stone. Um, and then it became a head, a bearded, feathered head. And it was looked after by maidens, like a lot of the gra various grail manifestations. But also it was guarded by, and the term is very interesting, it was guarded by baptized men. Why didn't it just say guarded by Christians? But no, baptized men. So in yeah. other words, it was guarded by John's followers, not followers of Jesus. I mean, it's hugely, hugely right. heretical, isn't it? I'm just 
Mm-hmm. Yes, definitely. Yeah. And speaking of heretical, you know, mm. some people may or may not realize that your work and Clive's work hugely influenced the Da Vinci Code and you both <laughs> actually feature in the film yeah. <laughs> on the bus. <laughs> the communities, darling. Yeah. <laughs> That's but right. I have to say, we did have the most wonderful day. It was actually Clive's birthday 10, year, ten years ago when we did it. Oh. Um, and... Um, um, we, I mean, Tom Hanks sang happy birthday to us and everything. It was really special. You can't beat that. <laughs> well, I know. I mean, in fact, Clive said he could never have another birthday after that. Oh, no. <laughs> Just stop there. Perfect birthday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of Leonardo da Vinci, you know, you talk about in the book that, you know, when he died, he had the painting of John the Baptist, the painting mm. of the Mona Lisa, yeah. and then also within the Da Vinci Code, obviously, they talk about the Last Supper, but yeah. you don't really ascribe to the whole bloodline theory. Like, how do these all, all of these strands connect with the theories that, that you present? Well, the, the, sorry, I didn't quite hear. The, um, what is the Last Supper? How does the Last Supper connect? Right, how do all these threads connect with these paintings in terms oh, yeah. of your theory that it's yeah. not necessarily the bloodline? Well, yeah, the bloodline, well, I don't believe, well, listen, sorry, can we start with that? Because I just want people to be clear yeah, about you know, where I'm coming from about the bloodline. Um, um, you know, if, if Jesus and Mary Magdalene were in a physical relationship, because, and I think they were, um, then it's likely that they might have had children, in, especially in those days. If both of, you know, I, I, they were of, of an age, or certainly if she was of a childbearing age, we don't know that, but, she, you know, she probably was, and they might have had children. My problem with the bloodline, uh, the whole bloodline thing, is that there is no hard evidence whatsoever that A, they had any children, or B, that they um, survived. And, and you look at, for example, what happened after Jesus died. Um, his brother, James, became Bishop of Jerusalem. Now we know that. We also know that Jesus had two nephews who died later on. We know about that. There is no mention whatsoever of any children. And I don't see why not. I mean, if he had them, why not? You know. So my point is, he could have had, but we don't know. And, it, and I just think it's you know, it's it's almost like a fairy tale to sort of speculate and say this and that and the other thing about it. And you say, well, yes, okay, it could have happened. But, you know, then if we're being realistic, we simply do not know. Plus, as you point out, if they were followers of John, actually, if the Templars were the followers of John instead, yeah. why would they be so concerned about a bloodline? Well, Which yeah. I thought was an interesting point. Well, yeah. Um, and, but, you know, we're looking at sort of two, two separate, um, traditions that, if you like, the Jesus Christians and the John Christians, you know, um, you know, sort of rival factions. Um, but I mean, I was going to say, and, and suddenly I realized I was going to say something very foolish indeed, but I was, I was going to say, that of, <laughs> course, of course, the Jesus Christians won the day, you know, they, they, they're the victors and therefore they wrote history. But actually, they only won the day, well, they won the day overall, yes. But, I mean, the, the Templars were, the, you know, the most important and um, uh, the richest and, you know, everything um, uh, organization in Europe for 200 years. Okay, it was only 200 years, but, and they were, not every last one of them, I have to say, but the, the inner circle of the Templars were what known as Johannites. They were John the Baptist followers. So the Johannites, you know, did actually come to the fore for some time in history, but then it all went, fell to pieces again and went underground again. But, um, I mean, I got interested in Leonardo da Vinci because of the way he played, and this, of course, this is, of course, impossible, <laughs> impossible really to talk about because I don't have the images and I can't show you the images. But um, his his work is very um, John the Baptist, pro-John the Baptist. And, you know, you get a lot of modern academics saying things like, oh, Leonardo was the first scientist, and he was, a, he was an atheist, you know, he, he didn't go in for any of this religion. Absolutely not true. You look at um, it works such as um, the Virgin of the Rocks, um, and you actually see what's really going on there. That's fascinating. Um, it, it's a whole John the Baptist thing, and it crops up time and time again in his paintings. We deal with that in our book, Temple Revelation. Um, um, and I talk about it in my book, Mary Magdalene. Um, I think I do anyway. Right. Um, yeah, you but, do. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the, but it, the Last Supper is the, is the Mary Magdalene one because, um, 
It was your friend Lynn who I think was the first, certainly the first person I know of, who noticed um, that, you know, it's a very odd composition because you have Jesus and the young man, in quotes, sitting next to him, leaning away from each other. And right. especially interesting because in the description of the Last Supper in the New Testament, it talks about the, the young um, St. John leaning against Jesus. And you think, wait a minute, this is this is to draw your attention to something because it's the opposite of what it should be. And Leonardo was a master psychologist, you know. He knew what people expected to see and he just did the opposite. Um, so what is he drawing your attention to? And the shape made from the two characters is a giant M. Some people say a V, and you know, yeah, okay. But um, a giant M shape. Um, and, um, and, and I think, well, why? And, and then I looked at the quotes young man and realize it's very much a young woman. I mean, I know um, St. John is often um, portrayed as rather effete, but, you know, nobody's that effete, really. Um, <laughs> and this, this, was a, this is a girl. Um, and, uh, and, you know, so it's fairly obvious it's supposed to be Mary Magdalene. And there's, um, and there's also, you know, in most depictions of Jesus in the Last Supper in front of him, there's, you know, usually a great grail-like cup because, you know, that was the time when he instigated the, you know, what became the sacrament and um, saying, you know, this, drink this blood in remembrance, of, sorry, drink this wine in remembrance of me, shedding his blood, um, you know, and, and, and the bread, um, his broken body. Um, but in fact, if you look at Leonardo's Last Supper, there is no great cup in front of Jesus. In fact, there's a little ordinary glass, a tiny glass, but still with some wine in it. And if you look at the whole table, there's virtually no, you know, I mean, there's virtually nothing there. And tiny little bits of bread, not very much broken. And it's like um, Leonardo is saying, look, I don't believe this man actually did die for our sins. I don't believe he did shed his blood for us. I don't believe his body was broken for us. So that's yet another heretical thread in, the, you know, in Leonardo's painting. There's the Mary Magdalene being literally joined at the hip, if you look at the painting, with Jesus um, and sitting there next to him, like it says in the Gnostic Gospels, you know. Um, oh, no, an interesting thing, actually, because, you know, you say, well, how would Leonardo know about the Gnostic Gospels? We've only just discovered about them now. But no, that's not true, because there were actually secret, his, secret, Gnost, secret Gospels circulating in the south of France and northern Italy when he was around, and he may well have known about them. We don't know what oh, they were okay. or what they said, but we, but you know, the, the, certainly the south of France would indicate that there was a lot about Mary Magdalene in them. Right, and, and when she arrived in France, what do we actually know about her life there? Like, what's the myth and what's the fact? Like, what were you able to decipher in your research about that? Um, well, yeah, you see, it's all myth, really. Um, unfortunately. Um, you know, she, you won't find in, in any of the Gospels, either Gnostic or, or Biblical, that, you know, that's what she did. Nobody's interested in her, after, you know, at all, um, from their perspective. Um, uh, but the story goes, and it's a fascinating one, that she landed in the south of France, what is now Provence. Um, she went to uh, Marseille um, and preached on um, the... Uh, steps of the temple, I believe, of Diana, anyway, of a goddess. And I think that's very interesting because what did she preach? You know, whenever you read about um, the other Christian missionaries going and insisting on preaching on the steps of a pagan temple, they get beaten up. Um, she, <laughs> she, she didn't. She obviously, what she, whatever it was she said, was pretty much the kind of thing that they could take, that they were intrigued by, or that, that actually matched what they were saying. She was pretty much speaking as a priestess among priestesses. So, you know, that's, that's certainly, um, obviously speculation, but it's, um, uh, you know, I've, I've kind of deduced it. Sorry, that's my other phone. I'm going to switch it off. Sorry, I should have done that earlier. That's all right. Uh, um, and, um, yes, so, and then she went around, um, what is now the Languedoc area and, and Provence. Uh, this is uh, this is according to the the, the legend, and she um, um, again preaching, baptizing in the local streams, 
And you still get streams now, which is very intriguing, of course, called the Source Magdalene, uh, Magdalene stream. There's lots of them. Um, and, you know, they pop possibly other reasons, but the local legends are very strong about her. Um, and then it says that um, that she um, basically lived like a, um, um, I was going to say refugee, no, she, 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 <laughs> she sort of, you know, wore animal skins a bit like John the Baptist um, and, you know, wore her hair very long and um, lived, this, lived in a cave, basically. Um, and she lived a long, long time and died perhaps in her 80s. Um, and um, I just, I, I think there might be elements of truth in that. I mean, but, you know, we might never know. We might never know. Right. right. Mm-hmm. We've got all this glamour and this tourist attraction now around, around Renle Chateau. Yes. Um, what do you think was actually found there, if anything, by Sonia? Um, I'm not sure that whatever happened in, in that story happened at Renle Chateau. I think, uh, I, I mean, there's a lot we don't know. Let's be honest. We don't, we don't know. I mean, certainly I he, um, he got very rich. Um, he got very rich virtually overnight. But a lot of that story doesn't hold up. Um, he was um, a, um, a monarchist, um, and that is very, very important. And there's no mystery about that. He preached on the, you know, on the, on the subject of vote. You must. He said to his, his, his flock from the pulpit, "You must vote for the monarchist." You know, in in, in the election, coming in election. Um, and it seems that you know he attracted. Um, um, you know, Habsburg archdukes flogged all that way to this remote place in the back of beyond in the south of France to see this nobody priest. And we don't know why. You know, you know, famous opera singers weren't there. We don't know why. Um, did he have some kind of secret? Um, well, he might have thought he did, you know. Um, and, but the thing, the thing that is often overlooked is the importance of his brother Alfred. Alfred, um, was a, a tutor for the, um, Chef Debian family. Oh, I think I might have got that wrong. Sorry, I haven't got any notes in front of me. But anyway, I'm saying that. Uh, Chef Debian or the Chambord family. Um, and he was, sadly, Alfred was an alcoholic um, and got fired. But he didn't get fired just for being drunk. He got fired because he was caught going through papers. Um, and it does seem that he was looking for something. Sonia was looking for something. Alfred was looking for something. And it was something to do with the noble families in that area, their past, their, you know, a couple of hundred years before, maybe. Um, and that was going to help the monarchist cause. That is all I think, well, certainly all I can say with any, you know. Um, it, was ab- it was about the monarchist cause. And they probably did invest it with, you know, some um, Catholic mysticism, or even semi-pagan Catholic mysticism, because it doesn't feel like that. Um, and there were elements of the Scottish right, rectified Scottish right of Freemasonry, which is tied up perhaps also with the, you know, the, the monarchist candidates or, or the monarchist people. Um, but, you know, I, I personally really don't know, and I'm not sure that a lot of people do. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> a lot of speculation and a lot of theories, but no proof. <laughs> I mean, you know, one, one can say, one can say with a great deal of certainty that, um, that he was, uh, Sonia was, uh, very fond of Mary Magdalene and, you know, was part of a kind of local Mary Magdalene cult. Um, in fact, about 50 miles away in the Ariage, um, there was another priest called Father de Coma, um, Father de Como, I think, um, who, uh, and again, there's, you know, the, the, well, there's no mystery about where he got his money from, but he got quite a lot of money. And he built an underground station of the cross, but it was a huge underground sort of grotto with a life-size statue of Mary Magdalene in it. Um, and apparently this this priest will run around in, in drag, basically, wearing women's clothing. But maybe that's another subject. <laughs> um, um, but, that but sounds he, fun, though. <laughs> <laughs> he was very much a part of this Mary Magdalene thing. Um, and, the, you know, it was, it was a local priest thing. Again, we see people focus entirely on Sonia, but he was part of something else, you know. And I think, you know, everybody's concentrating on him and not really seeing that there's, you know, other people in the background pulling his strings. Right, right. 
in terms of the, we have all these black Madonnas in the churches, particularly mm. in, in France and, and Spain. Mm. Um, how are they key to understanding these hidden mysteries behind Mary Magdalene and also Isis? Well, um, it, they're fascinating because nobody really understands the whole black Madonna thing. It, it black faced, um, statues of the Virgin and Child, or so they appear to be. And in, in, as you say, in, in many churches, I mean, there are one or two in places like Poland, even in England, one or two, but mainly um, concentrated in the south of France and in Spain. Um, and wherever they are, they're associated with Mary Magdalene cult. And um, it occurred to me that it, you know, go for the, you know, um, Occam's razor for the, the, the simplest solution that maybe it, it's associated with her. Um, because she was black, <laughs> she could have been. Um, right, right. Uh, um, and um, I mean, we don't have again anything other than a few hints here and there. Um, um, but I'm quite amused by how often, um, and even in the past, um, you know, when they put put on um, performances of Jesus Christ Superstar, the Mary Magdalene character is black, and I think that's probably, you know, something in the consciousness about this, you know, some kind <laughs> of intuition. Um, um, but, um, yeah, I mean, it, she, she could have been. And as you say, though, there is an association with the Black Madonnas and the cult of Isis. But again, we have both of those, again, associated with Mary Magdalene. So it's the sort of the goddess, the priestess, that, you know, and if you want to look at the, the blackness of the skin as a metaphor, it's it's the, the deep, dark mysteries, if you like, of, of the goddess, of which Mary Magdalene is very much a part of. Right. And it, it seems, as you point out, it seems an inherent racism, but it's also, it seems to be a running away from our own inner darkness or our, our inner mysteries that the women, um, the women's mysteries represent. Well, yes. I, 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 I think, well, you know, one has to put the, the statues in um, in. The, Perspective, I suppose, because you know, in, imagine some French village 200 years ago with their black Madonna. They would never see a black person. You know, um, it would be something right. quite exotic and astonishing. Um, I mean, there's some you know areas of, of, of Britain where you hardly see a, a, a black person. It's it, it, it's it's a sort of exoticism and, and and the extra special air of you know sort of transcendent knowingness. I mean, you know, that sounds terribly pompous. Wish I hadn't said that now. Um, but, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, you know the, the, this sort of um, very um, 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 kind of Arab features. Um, well, certainly not African features. You know, it, the skin is black. Um, it's, well, maybe it's just a, a blend of, of two traditions, you know, that she embodies. But she but the Black Madonna sits there in church after church after church, associated with the local Mary Magdalene cult, and she sits there with a child on her lap. And of course, people have said, well, the association is that Mary Magdalene had this child, and you know that's a big secret. Um, well, if she did, I don't even. I mean, I don't actually understand why it should be a secret. I mean, I just don't get exactly, that at all. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and um, in this whole business about you know all uh, Jesus. And, and her were married, and I, and I, and I always say, well, why doesn't it say so in the New Testament? You know, you look in the Old Testament, and the wives all over the place. Um, uh, you know, you look in the, <laughs> you look in the New Te Testament, and you know, you get um, the interesting thing about Mary Magdalene is she's the only woman in the entire Bible, Old and New Testament, who is not defined by her relationship with a man. Everywhere else, it's so-and-so, wife of so-and-so, so-and-so, sister of so-and-so. And in the New Testament, it's just Mary Magdalene. Um, and she all, also, her, her name heads up a list of women. So she's the most important one of all the women. And that's as far as they go in the, in the you know, Bible. Um, but um, she, <laughs> she's, you know, very, obviously very powerful. But also the implication, because I say she's just there, Mary Magdalene, the implication is that she, you know, she's incredibly famous. Because you get the impression that the guys, who, whoever the hell they were, who wrote the New Testament, they did, I mean, the, 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 the Gospels anyway, they 
did not like her, and they, and they would have given anything to have been able to leave her out of, of, of their story, but she was too famous. They had to put her in. Um, so, you know, so it, it's just astonishing, really. But the, yeah, to, to the Black Madonna thing, I think it's, it, it is a deep, deep mystery. But then, of course, in Spain, you know, they had um, a long time of being uh, basically occupied by the Moors. So, unlike in areas of France that would never, as I say, never have seen a black face, whereas Spain was, was used to certainly images of of, um, of black featured people. So, um, you know, again, that's uh, it, it's always fascinating to me just how many sometimes rather wonderful theories <laughs> come up um, with these things, and I'm, you know, I'm not casting doubt on any of them. They, some of them might well be true, but I'm just sort of sticking to the facts, if there are any, you know, that's kind of where I'm from, right. which is where I am, as you know, on the bloodline. Yes, yeah, exactly, exactly. And it, it makes sense, you know, like mm -hmm. looking at the statues, I mean, that's kind of the commonsensical first place that you go to, you yeah. know, like the, the color of yeah. the skin trying to be replicated. So it, yeah. it does make sense. Well, I mean, there's, there's a little story about some child saying to the local priest in church looking at the Black Madonna saying, Father, why is she black? To which you replied, she's black because she's black, my son. <laughs> 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 I think, yeah, okay. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, there's some ludicrous things about uh, they're all black because uh, they weren't cleaned properly. And I think, what? You know. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think so. If you if you study them, if you examine them, because I've seen them in Spain, yeah. and there's no way it's because of they have the fact that they haven't been cleaned. They were created that way. Yes, exactly. Black wood. Yeah. Yeah. Or you know, yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, there's some crazy. You know, sometimes the sort of conventional theologians and people would do and say anything rather than say fact. You know, um, and the importance of Mary Magdalene is a fact. Um, what you know, one might choose to interpret it in different ways. You know, some people say she was married, some people say she wasn't, blah blah blah. But nevertheless, her sheer importance and influence is just astonishing. And, and heaven forbid, an African woman who was influential should have power or be yeah, remembered. Exactly. Heaven forbid, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. <laughs> we still see this today. I'm sure you get it too, being an intelligent woman that, you know, the first place they want to go to is with your looks. And then when they hear that you're intelligent or they hear you speak, then they're like taken aback and then they don't know what to do with it. And like not everybody, but some people. And it's still frustrating today to have to deal with those stereotypes of women. Well, I know. I mean, it's also, I mean, this is a very minor point. I realize, you know, up against the really big questions, but you know, I, um, I occasionally do radio, obviously, and here I am doing it. But, you know, some of the, some people uh, I know say, yeah, we heard you. You've got quite a pronounced Yorkshire accent, haven't you? And I say, yeah, but the thing is, never mind about that. You know, what do you think about what I said? Oh, I can't remember Exactly. That. You know. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yes. It's always taking it down to a level of externals rather than looking yes. at the content. Yes. yes. Um, not to mention the fact that I think, really? Do I really? <laughs> <laughs> I think you have a beautiful accent, Lynn. Oh, you lovely. Thank you, thank you. Well, yes, indeed. So do you. So do you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. They told me the last time I did filming, don't lose your American accent. I think that's why they want me, because I've got the American accent, right? <laughs> well, between us, they've got something quite exotic. That's <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> The dark-haired beauties who are smart. <laughs> that's it. That's it. We are, we are the complete package. <laughs> that's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in what ways, besides, you know, the, the Christian religion, we've been talking about that, but we see this across the board with the Abrahamic religions, don't we? And you talk about this, of there's a turning of the backs to the, to the feminine, to the goddess yeah. that that yeah. that's taken out of scripture and yeah. and the stories and it's mm -hmm. just pushed to the side and marginalized. Well, yes, I mean, 
in the, in the original, as far as we know, of course, you know, it doesn't go back that far, but as far as we know, the original Jewish religion had goddesses. You know, the, the evidence has been found, and there's not much of it, but for example, little prayers written on, scratched on um, shards of, of pottery with prayers to Jehovah's wife, Asherah, you know. And the idea of Jehovah, Jehovah having a wife might be quite shocking to a lot of people, but nevertheless, to the people who lived a very long time ago, um, you know, the option was you could pray to God's wife. Um, and then, as is the way with these things, she was dropped. In fact, she became a demon. Um, you know, I mean, literally demonizing, you know, the feminine. Right. Um, and the same thing happened to Mary Magdalene. You know, she is the Christian goddess. Um, no two ways about it. You know, um, she was rapidly dropped, even though it meant insulting Jesus by doing so. I just want to say something I forgot to say before. When we're talking about, you know, her um, uh, anointing him and Christ anointing him in this little ceremony, well, this big ceremony, um, that, um, you know, it it was astonishing um, that Jesus says in, in, in the New Testament, he says, Basically, wherever the gospel is preached, her name will be celebrated for this. And her name isn't even given in that little little passage. I mean, we only know it because we can piece together who it is, let alone her being celebrated. I mean, you know, the baptism of Jesus is well known and various things that happen to him have feast days in the Catholic Church. But the, the one ritual that actually turned him into Christ isn't... I mean, the woman who did it isn't even known by name to most people. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Jesus' own words, in other words, he's, he's saying, I wish that, you know, wherever the gospel is preached, she, she was, she'd be celebrated for this. I mean, just absolutely ignored. Um, because it was very inconvenient, to say the least, to have generations of women who thought for themselves, who act, acted like priestesses, you know, who basically would be a challenge to the Vatican. I think they still would. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm. And bringing that into a modern context, I wanted to ask you, in terms of, you know, world affairs and what's going on today, how much do you think that's tied to the absence of the feminine, the absence of the goddess, and the fact that she's been relegated to the sidelines, like basically smothered, covered up, forgotten about? I think it's got to be incredibly important in the psyche of, of not just men who commit atrocities, obviously that's uppermost in our minds these days, but I think in the psyche of, of the, the West, certainly in general, and, and the East, um, I mean, that's not to say that, I think you have to be very straight, it's not to say that, you know, women can't be horrible, they, you know, um, women can't be killers, we know they can. Um, and that's not to say that goddess worshipping people have not in, have not committed atrocities because they have. Um, but what we have now, very very widely across the entire world, is an unbalanced society where you know testosterone rules, um, and where you know it, taking just a simple thing like you know computer games, it's all about killing and um, it's about you know, men, um, and it's and destruction. Um, and whereas you do have, you know, the uh, in, certain goddesses are about destruction, most of the goddesses are not about destruction. Most goddesses are mother goddesses in some aspect of their being. Um, and but the but the important thing about the feminine principle um, is that it's it's allowed to flourish. It's allowed, women are allowed to have a voice, and if you look at the magical or, or if you like, spiritual angle, that women are allowed to behave like priestesses and to understand what it means, um, and to behave like goddesses as well. Um, you know, are allowed to take their place in the world, which might not be the same as, as, as a man's place, perhaps. Perhaps it shouldn't be, but to have a perfect balance or as near perfect balance as you can get between the male principle and the female principle, which is, you know, a constant battle because you never, almost never have a perfect balance in anything. But I think it's such a shame that, you know, despite, you know, women's lib in the 70s and all of that, and, and indeed, let's not, 
you know, do them down, and they did great things for for women. But it's such a shame because of that now, just when you know we're kind of consolidating and moving forward uh, uh, in women, I mean, uh, that it, we're now being hit by, you know, these, as you say, these basically men gone mad with no um, yes. balance at all, no feminine input because women are not allowed to to have an input. Um, it's it's terrifying because of of the imbalance, and if it goes on like this, it, you know, it will just well, we know what will happen. I mean, we don't even want to go there, but um, yeah, it's scary. Um, but you know, we do need, um, we do women also. You know, women do need to understand. I think it's not just a question of oh, well, women should take over or women should do this and do that. I I, I think you know, women have to do a lot of soul searching. Women have to. Um, be in touch with their transcendent or magical side, I think, but in a but in a constructive way. That's what I think. I think so too. I think mm. so too. And I think there there's great value in understanding the path of the feminine, uh, embracing that ourselves, mm. understanding the path of the masculine. Although we're we've been raised with that in a patriarchal society, yeah. and then coming together. And you know, in my relationship with Gary, that's so critical to us of like the union of the masculine and the feminine together. Like we embrace that internally ourselves, but then also coming together in unity as equal partners. And then that magic creates wonderful things out of it. And I think that's part of what the church wanted to subvert also, that that unity of the energies is such a beautiful thing and it cr can create amazing things, not solely children, though children are important, but they're in incredible, magical things that you can offer to the world out of that energy. I totally agree. Totally agree, yes. Um, and it's it's just allowing each other to be able to blossom in that, in that relationship. Um you know, each being more than a half, it, it, that's a magical thing in itself, being a, being a half but more than a half, you know. It's an enigma, but it's a very magical enigma. Um, um, and, you know, yes, I mean, allowing each other to have a voice, which is, you know, perhaps normal gender politics, but with a magical edge. That's a beautiful way to put it. <laughs> 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 so in terms of resurrecting Mary Magdalene, how far do you think we've come with that? Do you think that she's been elevated to a rightful place yet, or do we still have a ways to go to learn more things about her, to understand more about the importance of her role? Well, you see, this is this is a difficulty, isn't it? <laughs> because I'm, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm not one, as you know, I'm not one of these people who think one should elevate her until she's a goddess and, you know, fall down right. and worship her, because I just... And she's not, I mean, she's not a goddess. She might have um, taken on the role of a goddess in a ritual, but then, you know, but that doesn't make her a goddess. Um, I think she was a human being. Um, and, you know, and one of the things that I think that people often forget, be it about, the, the Ren, you know, Sonia and the Renault Chateau Mystery or Mary Magdalene or whatever, you know, um, people say, oh, well, you know, I think I know what they were about. So that's the big secret. And you think, well, actually, just because they were about something doesn't make that thing right. You know, they yes. might have believed, and people can believe all sorts of things that are just absolutely wrong. Sonia might have had some kind of obsession for some something or believed something was going to happen when in fact it was just madness, you know. Um, and Mary Magdalene, um, I mean, this is, this is a way that a lot of people do not want to think of her or indeed any of the others. But... There is a there is a case for seeing Mary Magdalene as another Middle Eastern fanatic. Um, I, I know that, that would yeah. you know I mean because Jesus was one, John the Baptist was one, and it's only by a kind of um, accident of history that uh, Europe you know the the West of the rest of the world has, has become caught up in in what they were about. When it comes down to it, we don't know what they were about. We don't know what Jesus' message was. To say that he said, and it was all about loving each other, I mean, that, I think that's naive to say the least. There's a lot in what he said that contradicts other stuff he said. We don't know what he was about. We don't know what she was about. Um, but whatever it was, he was very key to it. You know, we don't know what John the Baptist, we don't know what John the Baptist taught. Um, even, you know, can, it, the, 
you know, so to elevate one of them, I think is kind of missing the point because we don't know what they're about. So why would one elevate somebody from a very long time ago from a from a culture that if we were faced with it, real, we wouldn't know where to begin to understand it? Um, I just don't understand that. Why would one would elevate her? I think she's incredibly important socially and in religious terms and historically. But anything else, I don't know, basically. Yeah. And, and there's a great beauty, I think, too, in honoring someone as a human being. Yes. And that, that also is divine. Yes. I mean, that, that yes. we have faults and, and we yes. make mistakes and errors, but that's yes. part of being human. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I, as I say, I, 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 you get a very strong sense of her from, from the, from the Gnostic Gospels. And there's one bit where, um, she, obviously has been having yet another discussion adieu, with Jesus about doctrine and things and they come out and they're, they're talking to all of the gang and um, um, and she says something like this to Jesus she says why don't you tell them the bit we were talking about so even they might understand it and it's really you think oh dear that's a bit, you know. um, and, um, but it also does underline the fact that how deep she and Jesus are working together. You know, the way she sort of airily says, as an aside, you know, well, just tell them what we were talking about and so that they can understand it, you know. Um, um, I mean, not sure I would like her very much, but um, this is what, personally, you know, but I think I, I would admire her in many respects. Uh, she was very courageous, I think. Um, and she did have, I think she showed compassion, at least theoretically, you know, like when she said, let's, you know, why should we condemn people to hell? Let's go and give them another chance, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but again, we know very little about her. Um, but um, I just rather like the idea of of her being so different from all the other women that the men had, no, you know, they were sitting there with open mouths. They had no idea what, was, what had hit them. She was a little tornado, I think. <laughs> yeah, quite the inspiration in many ways. But as you say, maybe not to have as your best friend. <laughs> no, no, quite. I think she might, might have been rather demanding. <laughs> <laughs> An ancient form of a diva. <laughs> I think so. uh, well, I think that goes with, yeah. I think, she, I think she kind of did expect people just to fall in and do what she wanted, you know. Um, but... Um, Yes, I. But you know, I do admire her. I I do see that she's how important she has become. Again, through accidents of history, you know, she's become important, but not as important as she should have been historically, of course. Right. In terms of other parallels in the Bible, one of the things that you mention is Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. And mm. we see like a parallel relationship there, don't we? That's similar to what um, Jesus and Mary Magdalene experience. Well, it, yes. I mean, they, the Song of Songs in the Old Testament was, um, uh, well, apparently, uh, uh, you know, traditionally it is ascribed to King Solomon falling in love with the Queen of Sheba, this extraordinary exotic Arabic woman. Um, and um, and basically he wrote this love poem, which is the Song of Songs, and it's extraordinary why it should be in the Bible, because it's highly erotic, um, and it is associated with Mary Magdalene. I mean, you you read, it, it is, parts of it are actually read out on Mary Magdalene's Day in Catholic churches. <laughs> Which I find astonishing, <laughs> um, and um, it does, you know, it does seem that the connections of Sol Solomon connection with Jesus, just like the idea of of, of Osiris and Jesus, um, and obviously um, you know, the, the the exotic queen, perhaps black, you say, the exotic queen who just comes like a whirlwind into his world, and is and and basically Solomon just fell for her. I mean, you know, she could do no wrong, you know. She did eventually go away, but <laughs> but um, um, <laughs> um, but it's just I mean it, it is the most as I say astonishingly erotic poem, and even in traditional Christian churches, it is associated with her, and it just you think what? 
so yes, I mean, if you, you know, just don't take my word for it, go and get your Bible and read the Song of Solomon and your eyes will be coming out on stalks. Um, <laughs> so yes, and as I say, so it's associated with her and by, and, I mean, even just on that very sim simple point, it is for, for reasons that nobody can say for certain, but I mean, I think we can because, you know, the, going, again, going back to the early Vatican, I mean, they knew all about her and Jesus. And somehow or another, that particular thing slipped through the net, the association of her and, and, and Sheba and the Song of Solomon. Um, and perhaps also she had some ethnic association with Sheba's homeland. Um, again, that's some speculation, but there's one or two hints in the New Testament about that. Um, I mean, she quite clearly was not, you know, a local girl from either Galilee or, or Jerusalem. Um, as I say, her behaviour was so totally different. It was much more like um, an Egyptian, because Egyptian women were the most um, free um, and equal, admitted not by today's standards, but by their standards, of anybody in the known world. Um, uh, you know, especially who had a bit of money, and Mary Magdalene quite clearly did, because her name comes first in the list of the women who basically were donors to the mission. So um, she was rich. She was famous enough not to be left out of the New Testament, even though the writers didn't like her. Um, and she was rather mysterious. So she's got everything going for her, hasn't she? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. i got to jump in there, guys. We're at the top of the, uh, well, second hour there. Um, wow, what That's an enthralling, amazing. what an enthralling conversation, guys. Uh, I was just I know, sitting in there. Been. Um, very thorough and uh, enlightening. Um, uh, Lynn, you've got to come back sometime. You've got such a wealth of knowledge for the show. Oh, I'd love uh, to. And, it's, you know, yes. and, and of course, I talk. I'm, I'm doing my Mary Magdalene. And Paul Heather is not getting a word in. <laughs> but, um, no, I'm getting lots of questions in, Lynn. Don't oh, worry. It's been yeah. so fascinating. No, oh, well, you've just been brilliant, both of you. Thank you. Well, oh, well, thank you. Lynn, I'm thank sorry you we didn't get a chance on. to talk much at the Origins, but uh, it was great to see you there as well. A great conference and a great great to have you on the show as well we got there eventually uh, <laughs> we're just going to give it the website one more time that's uh, picnetprint.com you can follow today's author and researcher and uh, you can check out all her books as well as uh, the Mary Magdalene one but uh, I thank you for your time today Lynn and Heather thank you thank you thank, thank, you. thank you so much Lynn and thank please thank come you. back oh I will don't worry well, you want me and I can't me? wait to meet you in person <laughs> <laughs> be wonderful. Yeah. thank you for having me Hopefully. Exactly. <laughs> we'll stick together. <laughs> so in terms of the Gnostic Gospels, what do they reveal about what Mary Magdalene's true role was, not only with Jesus, but also amongst the apostles? Because there's some really interesting mm. information there, especially like about Peter and the way that he viewed her mm -hmm. also. Yeah. Oh, yes. yes, I mean, there's absolute revelation in the Gnostic Gospels like, um, about um who Mary Magdalene was, and you know, in, in as you say, her relevance to Jesus is astonishing. Um, but she was, as I say, she 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 was trouble. <laughs> um, I often think that um, it comes it comes across, you know, it, loud and clear that she was a kind of Yoko Ono character. You know, you remember? Well, I'm not saying you remember, but people remember how you know when um, John Lennon fell in love with Yoko Ono, and she she started rightly or wrongly it was it was said that she broke broke the band up she broke the beatles up um and but he of course absolutely adored her and he couldn't see what what she was doing wrong or what you know why they were taking this attitude and it, just, it looks like that to me that when mary Magdalene kind of took over it has to be said in jesus's mission um the um you know the men did not like it they didn't understand it um, she behaved, didn't behave like a, you know, a, a good um, a Jewish woman sort of hiding in corners and just getting them, you know, washing her feet and looking after them. She she wanted to be there in the limelight. She wouldn't shut up. Who does that, sh that remind me of? Anyway, she wouldn't shut up. <laughs> and, um, and she, you know, she, she was very feisty. She, as I say, she was just not like the usual woman from from the men we used to and peter especially saint peter was simon peter he he hated her i mean he there's no two ways about it and we know this because mary went to jesus and said peter hates 
the whole race of women, and I'm afraid of him because he threatens me. I mean, you know, you really read that as, you know, he threatens to either beat me up or kill me, or both, you know. Um, exactly. Je- Jesus was a complete sort of diplomat and smoothed it over, but you, the, very much the impression you get is if it, the moment he's not there, all hell will break loose. Um, and then uh, Peter goes to Jesus and says, Lord, let Mary leave us, for women are not worthy of life. Um, and oh, my think, goodness. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's this rather wonderful bit, I think, um, because it's quite funny. I mean, you kind of have to see it. You know, like, I don't know, like it reminds me a bit of school, um, because you have this in uh, this uh, whole question and answer session with Jesus. Again, I'm talking about the Gnostic Gospels. Um, I think there's something like 42 questions Jesus either asks or answers, and it's, you know, it's thrown open to all the disciples, including, I have to say, some women. There's Martha, Mary's sister, and one or two others. Um, but of the 42 questions, Mary Magdalene either asks or answers 39. <laughs> oh, wow. and, and, the, and the men really, really don't like it. And they're completely baffled as to why she's allowed to do it. And she has this this um, thing that she does. This sort of, I have to say, I'm sorry, but a kind of false modesty because she knows what she's doing. And she begins every statement or every question she makes. She says, Lord, don't be angry with me. But, and then she launches into this thing that she's going to say. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, you have uh, Philip, St. Philip, who's, who's the, he's taking the notes, he's the note taker for the session, and he complains, and he says, you know, not in these words, obviously, I'm an outcast in some ways, usually sexually, um, that they were known as Magdalens, you know. Um, uh, it was it, it, it was automatically, you know, associated with the idea of her as this sort of eternal penitent, somebody who has to suffer for being a full female. It's just uh, it's just really scary, you know. It even is. for me, growing up as a the daughter of a single mother, like mm. she was divorced, but still, I saw what my mother had to go through that I don't have to go through now. Yeah. But it's just really frightening how slowly things changed and mm. how women were treated. Oh yes, yeah. appallingly. Absolutely appallingly. Um, you know, I mean, the, 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 some of the, uh, the the stories about the, the girls who ended up in the Magdalene laundries in Ireland, you know, they didn't have children um, outside of marriage, and you know, some of some of them just did vir- virtually nothing at all. One girl, for example, was caught walking down a road talking to a cast- to a Protestant boy, and that was enough. The local priest oh, said, "That's just you know absolutely outrageous. You know, she'll never see the light of day again," and she didn't. There is actually a movie, well, there's actually a couple of television um, series as well, but there's a movie that won awards simply called The Magdalene Sisters, and it's very hard-hitting, right. very hard-hitting. I've seen it a while ago, yeah. but yeah, it was yeah. really powerful. And really at the powerful. end, do you remember at the end where all those names just came up silently, name after name uh, after name, yeah. of, the, of the women that they, they found? I mean, thousands upon thousands of them, just astonishing just disappeared into the system. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I teach a women and gender roles class, and these are the kinds of things we talk about all the mm-hmm. time, looking at the history of how things have evolved, yeah. but yet also how a lot of things haven't changed. And it comes back again to this Madonna horse split yeah. that was created by the church yeah. and is still in, is in existence today and the yeah. way women are viewed. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, it's, it is it is astonishing um, how I mean somebody was saying to me this has got nothing to do with Mary Magdalene but it's just the way even um, you know sort of in in shall we say um, uh, liberal society you know it, in in sort of media terms um, you know these these things kind of still permeate and um, you know it was talking about um, uh, these days you know on any kind of panel on 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 BBC television you know you have to have a woman you see and this guy I was talking to who an older sort of uh, um, ex BBC producer and he said oh just imagine trying to find some woman who knows what she's talking about all the time. And I said, but you've been doing it for decades with, with men. Does this mean that every single time, every man that you got on there was a really good panelist? And if not, right. suppose not, you know. Right, exactly. You know, and, and we can proudly say that we're the two women on Forbidden History. <laughs> <laughs> we are indeed. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Holding it up for our gender. <laughs> Well, quite sometimes I wonder, you know, when you go to conferences and I'm the only woman there, you know. 
Um, exactly. And I just think, you know, what is this? Um, but, uh, well, yes, you know, we've got things to say and we should be allowed to say them, really. But I think women often, we don't push ourselves, you know, that, I mean, we kind of have to, which is annoying, but. It's true. That's mm. true. I often I say that to Gary, you know, my husband, mm. I'm like, you know, there's Lynn and now they're saying there's me and there's like, there's not a lot of women out there and they keep yeah. telling me this and I'm like, well, we're going to change that. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> of course. Yes. I mean, you know, we just need a bit of passion and a bit of humor and a bit of, you know, whatever else it takes and, and off we go. Hopefully, exactly. It's what she comes from. And it would seem to mean great lady. So it could either mean that it's a joke nickname because she was very tall or very fat. <laughs> we don't like to think of those, <laughs> those terms. Um, or because she was a great lady. Um, or because she puts on her airs and graces, perhaps. You know, one has to consider these things. So, um, but whatever she was, she existed. And I think that's a, another big question these days. And the reason I say that with some degree of confidence is that... Um, when she appears in both the New Testament and the Forbidden Books, the Gnostic Gospels, um, there's, there's conflict around her. There's negative stuff around her. And if you were creating, if you were just inventing somebody to stick in a gospel that you were writing for future people, you would make somebody all sweetness and light and a nice person and there was never any question about them. But in reality, Mary Magdalene caused trouble. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't actually choose to fabricate somebody like her. Yes, and that brings up, you know, the whole um, Madonna whore split that we see within society today. And she's so often identified with the whore. And how is that a misnomer? Well, it, yeah, you're right there. Absolutely, Heather, because... Um, you know, she's associated with the, the nameless woman who who committed sins and was possessed by demons and, and Jesus threw the, the demons out. Um, and a, a pope in, the, I think it was the 7th century AD, said basically his thinking was, look, Mary Magdalene was a woman. Uh, she had demons cast out of her. She was a sinner. Um, what kind of sin could it possibly be? Well, as, as she was a woman, it must have been sexual. She must have been a whore. So that was his thinking. Um, and it was very interesting, that, and I think it was 1968, something like that, the Catholic Church actually officially um, revoked that, that belief. They, they issued the statement saying there's no evidence that she was actually ever a prostitute. But they said it very, very quietly and didn't draw attention to it at all. So, in fact, um, most Catholics still think that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. But there's one thing, Heather, that is kind of amusing in a sick kind of way. But in the New Testament, it says that Mary Magdalene and, and lots of other women, obviously quite rich women, um, ministered unto Jesus and the, the male disciples of their substance, which actually means they provided money for the funds for the mission, for Jesus' mission. So right. if, Mary, if Mary Magdalene had actually ever been a prostitute, then Jesus and the other men would have been living off immoral earnings. <laughs> <laughs> It puts a new twist on it, doesn't it? <laughs> One of the really gripping things you begin the book with is talking about the Magdalene laundries. Oh. And this is a, a definitive side effect of this depiction of the Magdalene as the whore. Could you talk yeah. about that a little bit? Because it really pertains to today, doesn't it? It does. And thank you for bringing that up. Yes, I got very, very incensed, to put it mildly, um, by discovering, I mean, I didn't know anything about it. When I, when I started researching Mary Magdalene, I was just sort of generally just looking for things about her, things that had been done in her name. And to my absolute horror, I discovered, this was about the late um, 1990s, something like that, a scandal that was just then coming to light in Ireland, um, which basically there were these um, institutions going back at least a century, um, usually in remote parts of Ireland, um, called Magdalene Laundries. And basically um, they were attached to convents. 